This is potentially one of the more important videos I'll ever make on this channel because I know from firsthand experience that whenever I start talking about crypto to my wife, she turns off. <laughs> the whole idea of talking about something that hasn't happened yet and making plans for wealth management and accountants and business structure and staking and all of this stuff, we get very, very excited about that because we know what it means and like we know why we feel like that. But our spouses, in my case, my wife, they don't understand what's happening and so they can't get excited. They could also be people like my wife who's very much a realist. And unless it's in the hand, it's not real. And so there's hurdles there to overcome. The point of this video is to explain why your spouse is very excited about XRP specifically and cryptocurrency in general. And I'm not saying you have to go all in on XRP or crypto to start with, but it might help you have a better understanding of where that enthusiasm is coming from, what the source is. So first of all, let's dig into what money is and how money works. Before 1970, the US dollar was the world reserve currency and it was backed by gold. What that means is every dollar was exactly correlated to a certain amount of gold. And when you talk about the whole world in that way, it's very easy to be able to keep track of the value in the world. And it specifically helps the world understand how much they're able to borrow because whoever holds the dollars will always know the value of the dollar because it's related to something physical in being gold. However, in 1970, the US dollar was removed from being backed by gold. This meant that the US dollar itself as, it, as the currency, as the piece of paper was backed by itself. You don't need to know the complications of that, but the ultimate effect of having a currency backed by itself results in the possibility for an entire world to have a financial collapse. You'll notice that right now we are in that financial collapse. And of course, there's lots of people who think this might have been a narrative pushed deliberately, a whole plan pushed in action since 1970 when the gold standard was lost. This of course was an inevitability and an event like COVID and the lockdown that resulted in the economic downturn and the printing of money that resulted was very predictable even all the way back then. And so here we are in the crash of an economy. So that's a little historical background on everything that's been going on. And now I want to jump into a whole new sphere. Sorry for doing this, but it will paint the picture on how money operates. So if you're going into a shop and you're buying something, most people, the average Joe, believe that you just go into that shop and you buy something, right? You just tap your card or tap your phone and there it goes. The, the money's gone to the, that company. Or in another example, you might have a, a niece's birthday and you want to send them money. So you go on your banking app and you send them money, they receive it and that's all good, right? But there is more to that system that has massive inefficiency. For example, if you want to send money, to a friend in Spain, for example, and you're sending that money on a Saturday at 1 p.m. When you send that money, what has happened ultimately, the payment system actually operates on an hourly basis, right? The typical workday, Monday to Friday, eight to five. There is, it, it might be slightly different than that, but ultimately that's the point. So any money that's transferred outside of those hours actually isn't moved to the other person's bank, but the other person received value, right? They got money in their bank account. How did that happen? Well, every bank holds a reserve amount of money to act as like an insurance mechanism so that whenever money is transferred outside of the hours of operation, the receiver's bank will just pay the, their client, their customer, and they will tell the original bank, your bank, you owe us this much because we handled that payment outside of the working hours. Monday rolls around, they pay them back on that IOU. So the actual transfer of money is extremely inefficient. It can take three to five days to actually settle payments. That means settle the agreements, pay IOUs and all of that. And so you can see the, the built in there inefficiencies of how this all works. So let's go now into cryptocurrency. And I want to first explain what blockchain is. Very simply put, we've all played a game of Monopoly. I want you to imagine every time you pass go, somebody writes down uh, the this person received $200 when they passed go, or this person had to pay rent to this person and this person because they landed on that square. Imagine if someone was writing on a piece of paper every single time a transaction occurred. Once that small piece of paper is filled, then you, in order to keep it in order, you would link them together, right? You would chain them together. Let's say you've got a little bit of string and you chain them together through some hole punched holes. At the end of the game, you could have someone who's very upset about the result of the game, right? And they go, hang on a second. 
I swear there was a fine for you to pay, but you never paid me and I don't think you did it. So the person then goes, okay, let me look at these pieces of paper that are chained together, these little blocks of paper. Yes, in fact, you did. Here it is right here, the exact time that you paid, how much you paid and who you paid it to. And so what the block chain is, is essentially what we call in this area called a ledger. A ledger records all transactions made. And so the blockchain essentially just organizes these blocks of transactions, chains them together into this big filed system. And all of a sudden you have a massive record of all transactions. And so different blockchains have different purposes. Some will be just simply to record transactions. Some will be to help fund different companies within this crypto space to then deliver what they are looking to deliver. Let's say it's a, a crypto game. If you buy one of their tokens and you increase the value of that company that has their crypto game, they might be able to add more features and then become a success. It's just like investing. However, there are some cryptocurrencies that I'm going to change from now on to call digital assets, simply because not all cryptocurrencies are made to be a currency, right? So we're going to say digital assets from now on. Some digital assets have a different purpose, a purpose that is built under the idea of utility. And so now we're getting in, now you've got the historical background, you know what blockchain is, and you know how money operates behind the scenes at the banks. Now here's why your spouse is very excited about this whole thing. So far in all of blockchain and all of cryptocurrency, we have not yet seen a single digital asset that has had real world global utility. It's all been based on speculation, AKA, me believing that this company might be bigger in the future. That's speculation. What your spouse or your partner, or your girlfriend or boyfriend has discovered is a digital asset called XRP. There's likely a few other ones in here that are related, but XRP is the one that's driving most of this excitement. Now what XRP does is XRP is the tradable token under a company called Ripple. And Ripple's whole idea, the whole purpose is to rejuvenate and rejig and reset this whole financial system of all of the inefficiencies that it had. So what Ripple aims to do is resolve payments instantly, utilizing something called RTGS. RTGS is real-time gross settlement. That means whenever I pay someone, the end result is that they receive the money completely settled. None of this three to four days of waiting or I owe you this or you owe me this. None of that just settles immediately to the bank of the receiver. Now let me explain how XRP, the product is used in these transactions to make that happen quicker. Essentially, it's very easy to understand. You have bank A and bank B. This is me sending money to a relative in Spain. I use the same example. What happens is I say I want to send some money in, on my banking app. Those pounds get converted into XRP. XRP then on the receiver's end converts into the Euro, which would be the currency for Spain. So what this does is it means whenever I send money across border to another country, I don't need my bank to be holding the currency of that country. All they need to hold is XRP. So if everyone in the world, all the companies, all the businesses, all the countries owned XRP, no longer would we have those inefficiencies in the system. But as you very well know, if you have a limited supply of tokens, and lots of demand for those tokens, the price has to go up. In addition to that, XRP at an absolute maximum has 100 billion tokens available. 50% of those tokens aren't in action. They are actually held by Ripple, the company. So 50 billion tokens are actually available for the public to buy and sell. An even greater proportion of that is actually held by the likes of your partner, your boyfriend, girlfriend, or spouse, in addition to all the banks that hold it for that purpose, right? To be able to transfer the money very quickly. And so what you end up with is a lot of people holding the same asset with a limited supply. This is one of the reasons why XRP's price will go up. And remember, this is real world use case for this asset. We're not talking about Bitcoin here, which is basically built on the marketing, the idea that it's a store of value, when in fact, it doesn't actually really do anything, it has no real use case. So now that we've come across XRP, which has real world use case and not just a small amount of money, it's taken over the whole world. One of the key things to understand about XRP is that in order for the technology to actually work, the price of an XRP token has to be very, very high. 
This is actually a really complex topic and I'm not going to go into it in this video. I'm just trying to give you the ammunition to understand why they're so excited. So down to the technology, XRP has to be a very, very high price. And when you look at today's price, which is around 44 cents, we'll both agree that that's not a high price. Another reason why we're all very excited is because there is a court case right now that involves the Securities and Exchange Commission, that's the SEC. You'll hear that a lot if you're in these circles and Ripple, the company, the company that owns XRP. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the court case. However, when things get this much of a drilling legally, it usually means regulation is coming. When regulation comes, that means countries adopt different technologies, especially in this space. Many of the countries right now with their central banks and their large financial institutions are holding back a little bit until they see the result of this court case. The court case, as it stands right now, is heavily in the favor of Ripple. And so the anticipation is, is that Ripple will win this case or settle. This will open the floodgates to all the businesses who want to utilize XRP for their payments. And of course, because in order to operate properly, the price has to be high. The price increases at that moment. A lot of the interest right now in this space is converging on November. So we're about to be there now and all the way up until kind of March, 2023. And there's one big thing that I've left out here that I'm now going to explain. And this is even more detail into how money moves. And this is really, really important. So as it stands right now, money moves in this way. There are two layers. So we've got layer one and layer two. Layer one is that first step in the process of actually moving money from bank to bank. And that first step is the equivalent of me and my friend next to me, me telling my friend I'm going to give him $20 and then I give him $20. Okay, so there's two different layers. There's the messaging layer and then there's the value layer. I tell them I'm going to send them money and I give them money. Okay, so there are two layers in the banking system as well. The messaging layer and the value transfer layer. So when I'm sending money to the bank in Spain for that relative, I don't have any relatives in Spain, but please bear with the example. My bank, let's say that's Monzo Bank, wants to send to Santander. Monzo Bank will tell Santander, Lewis wants to send $100 to this account in your bank. And then to follow up from that message, the actual money, the actual value is sent from my bank to Santander. But it just lets Santander know exactly what they should be expecting to receive. That's all well and good. That's been the system forever. And in that message that goes across, you have things like that note section that you have on a transfer or the, the account number that it's, the money's been transferred from and the account number it's going to be received to. That's the kind of information that goes on these messages. So it's actually very basic information. Now, there's a company called Swift, and Swift are the company that handle all of those transaction messages. They create the structure, the format, and all of that, and they actually send all of those messages, those financial messages. Once the messages are sent, the value is then transferred. So you could very well say, that Swift, for all intents and purposes, is the messenger in this whole financial system across the world. Now, there's going to be an update to their, their messaging system. And this is what you will see around, and maybe you've heard them talk about it. It just sounds like a load of numbers, but it's called ISO 20022. This is a new messaging standard with different information. Now, this is where the excitement really comes from. In the typical system, we've had that normal amount of information that gets transferred on the messaging layer. Now, what has happened is that they're going to add a component of data, which will allow this message to be something we call data rich. It means lots more information. And that data rich information comes in the form of being able to move messages from blockchains. Now we've already talked about blockchain and we've talked about XRP. XRP being only one of two tokens that can actually deliver this service to the banks. And essentially when Swift update this ISO 20022 system, it will be integrating financial messages from blockchains into the traditional system as well. That means there is a new technology around and this technology allows the integration of digital assets being able to be used in these financial transactions. Now, considering there's only two digital assets that can actually provide the technology in order to be able to do this, you'll see why the excitement is coming, right? Every single bank around the world essentially operates using swift messaging. Understand where we are economically right now as a globe, the banks have run out of money. Ripple solves that problem. The payments process for the banks is very inefficient. Ripple solves that problem. Regulations are coming. Ripple will benefit from those regulations. XRP has a low price right now. 
and it needs to be very, very high in order to work. Hearing all the banks and all the countries are already talking about this technology being used in the very near future, and that it only points towards two assets, XRP and XLM. What your spouse has effectively done is the equivalent of going out into the desert, digging, and then a huge sprout of oil comes out. Like it, you have that visualization. It's, it's, this is what we've done. We've discovered something. We've joined the dots. We've just struck oil. So when you consider the price currently is about 44 cents and there are projections all the way up to 50,000, a hundred thousand, $250,000 per XRP. I hope you can now see why they are so excited about this. And sometimes I understand it's great to keep people leveled. You can just relax. Okay. And show me the money when it's here. But I do hope that this video has served to at least explain like why we're so excited, what we believe we have found and where the world's economy's inefficiencies are and how they're overcoming it and how that all plays a role into this excitement. Anyway, with that said, everyone who's left in this video, um, you can give your phone back to your spouse. Now you might not be interested in this, but, um, thank you for being here and thanks for watching. If you have any comments you want me to explain even further, please do let me know in the comments. But for everyone who is commonly here and watching these videos, you'll know that I closed the discord. I'm going to announce right now that I'm opening the discord up to the public once more until the discord hits 4,000 members. When we hit 4,000 members, the discord will be closed off again. We will make sure that everyone in the discord is secure and safe from impersonators and scammers where then as soon as we reach that point, we will then open up for another cohort of people and we will do this in increments of 1000 people. So when we get to 4,000, we'll shut it down. We'll make sure it's secure. We'll open it up until 5,000, close it down, make sure it's secure. And we'll, we will repeat that process. So if you wanted to join the discord, now is the time at all times. If you want to know the status of your ability to get into the discord, check the description of any video I post, it will be automatically updated there, whether we're accepting people through the invite links or we're not anymore. But I'm sure if you're this late in the video, you're probably going to be wanting to get into the discord. So join using the link in the description. Of course, if you want access immediately and you want access to the private channels, you can always become a member here on YouTube by clicking join next to the subscribe button. What you get with that is basically early bird insight into any research pieces I put out and also our weekly market update that comes every Sunday. In addition to that, if you ask your questions in the members only areas, I'm far more likely to be able to respond because the public chat is just crazy. It's, it's oftentimes too difficult for me to catch the questions that come in. So does that too. Hope this video served its purpose. Hope you have an easier time at home now. Stay emotionless out there, everyone. I'll see you in the next one.